Welcome everyone to the Coin Brief Podcast, episode number 16. This is your open source for digital currency news. Every week we talk about the latest uh, events in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space. So this week uh, we've seen some important news come out from uh, large Bitcoin companies and organizations. But what we're going to start with is talk about the price drop that happened um, over the past couple days. So the Bitcoin price dropped from, it was stable for a while, around $475 per Bitcoin. Stable around there for what, like a couple weeks or something, right, Evan? Yeah, about, you know, maybe two and a half weeks. Yeah, 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 pretty stable there. And um, But then, you know, a couple days ago, it was pretty sudden drop from 475 to around the 420 range, 410. And... And then another another day passed, and then we dropped some more to around 400. And I'm looking at this pr- the prices at, at this very moment on Friday evening at six o'clock Pacific Standard Time. It's about 394 dollars per Bitcoin. So we've been like it doesn't it's not quite a flash crash, but uh, it's it's pretty hefty drops over the past couple days and. Um, there's a lot of theories going on in the community about what has caused this drop, and there's a lot of factors at play. But um, you know, we'll we'll try and get into some of those and talk about the like the likelihood of some of these theories. Um, Evan, what do you? What's your analysis of this recent uh, price drop? Uh, yeah, it's pretty. Crazy. So I feel like I can confidently call myself a Bitcoin veteran now because of this crash. Um, Because anybody who's a regular watcher probably knows that I'm fairly new to Bitcoin. Uh, You know, I I thought it was a complete crock until March of this year. Uh, You know, so I've never seen it go below 400. And now, but now, you know, it went down when I woke up this morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time, it was like three seventy, um, and it didn't and it didn't even phase me. So, <laughs> so I guess you could say I, I'm an expert Bitcoin roller coaster rider now. You're an expert holder, it, expert yep. hodler. Um, <laughs> hodl. Hodl. <laughs> as far as like what happened, man, it's really. You, there's really not even like one single cause. Like you said, there yeah. is a lot of theories, um, and everybody arguing about which one's right and which one's wrong. But uh, you know, the way I see it, they all have contributed to it um, because all of them, you know, all of them really make sense. Like uh, the merchants, merchants selling their revenue so they can pay expenses. Um, obvious. That's uh, basic. You know, Econ 101, supply and demand, that's going to make the price go down. Then the miners are doing the same thing. You know, that's another basic economics. Uh, supply over demand, the price is going to go down. Um, and then, there, you know, there's just individual people who are feeding off this fear that's being created by the the, uh, the decline. And so we have individuals selling. Yeah. And, you know, it's just kind of like... A chain reaction. It's nothing. It's nothing that can be, you know, um, like an, like that can be analyzed, like with the Silk Road auction or something, where it was very obvious how it was impacting the price. It's just a combination of of lots of things. Uh, and if you know, if you want my personal opinion, I don't think it's gonna stop anytime soon because um, it's just the current state of the market. There's just too much, too many bitcoins are getting converted into fiat, and so there's just too much getting dumped on the market. So, yep. you know, it yeah. the, it might it might slow down. You know, there might be little pockets of, uh, uh, you know, little little pockets of prosperity where it goes back up to like 500 or something. But, um, I It'll think it'll be a while before we see that again. I think. Maybe oh a couple yeah, months. definitely. Yeah, definitely. And but yeah, it's like overall in the long term, it's probably going to continue falling until it reaches a point where um 
mining slows down a little bit, so there's not as much pressure from there. And, um, you know, in order to, in order to get stabilization, merchants have got to, like, they have to stop selling their revenue. Um, but that's not going to happen until they can pay their expenses in Bitcoin. So, yeah. And, you know. and even there's, there's a lot of merchants on board at this point where like, the literally the only reason they're accepting bitcoin is just for that extra little bit of revenue they don't care about bitcoin at all as the technology they don't care about it as a currency they don't care about any of the underlying principles they just want the they just want the extra revenue and they they want that extra revenue in dollars like they prefer dollars over bitcoins they're just they 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 fell into the the marketing ploy of Coinbase and BitPay and these others who tell them, you know, it's no, no transaction fees and, and like you'll attract a brand new customer base who, who you didn't have access to before, people who want to spend their Bitcoins on stuff. And the merchants are like, wow, this sounds pretty good, sweet. Like, like there's some, a lot of merchants are hurting for business right now and they'll take any extra source of revenue. And like those kind of merchants and i think that they're probably the majority of merchants who have come on board by now like they i don't think they're even going to be looking to um try and pay their suppliers in bitcoin because they don't care about bitcoin as as a currency or technology they just want the extra revenue so like that kind of that that kind of push is is being pushed by like like big players like Overstock, just because Pat Patrick Byrne is a firm believer in Bitcoin, so he wants to pay his suppliers in Bitcoin, and they're looking into ways of you know pushing adoption, and you know holding a relatively large percent of Bitcoin in profits instead of converting it. But like that's just Overstock, and we know that Overstock is is a huge supporter, and they've been a huge huge supporter for almost a year now. But like the vast majority of these thousands upon thousands of merchants who came on board with BitPay and Coinbase, like that's the service that BitPay and Coinbase provide to them. They convert Bitcoins to fiat immediately. And like it it doesn't go on to exchanges right away. Uh, it's, it's not like uh, BitPay and Coinbase, like automatically sell it on Bitstamp, which is what some people think. But I don't, I don't think that's how their actual operations work. They probably have a gigantic stash of cash lying around, which they hand off to the merchants. And then in exchange, uh, they they take the Bitcoin and just hold the Bitcoin. And then they probably wait uh, a little while to sell it off in gigantic blocks. Um, either m maybe on Bitstamp, they kind of spread it out on Bitstamp or other exchanges. Or maybe they sell it over the counter to, you know, maybe large investors who want to buy large stacks. But... Eventually, um, people who want to make returns on their money, they're going to end up selling it at some point anyway. And I think that even if Coinbase and BitPay aren't exactly directly related to selling on exchanges, somewhere down the line, that Bitcoin does get sold on exchanges a lot of the time for a lower uh, exchange rate, uh, you know, lower, lower ask offers, and that's what drives down the price. So like I mean, this I've been touting this theory for weeks now that merchant adoption can drive down price, and like you know some people are finally starting to listen to that as a possible um, possible driver of price, and and even um, CoinDesk um, yesterday did an article about the price drop, and they acknowledged that uh, merchant adoption can drive down the price, and they talked to an expert as well. And they, they actually, they, they kind of did an interesting way of analyzing how merchant adoption can, can impact the price. They said, okay, Bitcoin dropped by, uh, by 7.5% today. And Litecoin price also dropped today, but only by 5%. So Bitcoin and Litecoin markets are almost similar enough where we can compare them. And the only difference is that merchant adoption has happened uh, on a grand scale in the Bitcoin space. So by the difference between 5% and 7.5%, like we can attribute merchant adoption impact to just 2.5% of the drop in Bitcoin price. Okay. Mm, that sounds kind of shoddy. <laughs> it's kind of a stretch. Um, credit for uh, creativity uh, for trying to analyze that. But I don't think, I don't think that's a very accurate thing. Um, but like, for, forget the whole Litecoin stupid analogy thing. 
you know, 2.5% uh, drop attributed to merchant adoption, I think that sounds kind of accurate just for different reasons. You know, I can, I can kind of see um, Coinbase maybe dropping maybe 1,000 Bitcoins on an exchange, you know, in the early morning and dropping the price just like that. And then when the price drops a few dollars like that and someone sees a thousand bitcoins dropped on, a, on, ex on an exchange, lowering the price by 2.5%, then that's when the herd mentality kicks in and other people want to sell and bearish mentality picks up and it's a snowball effect. And then you get the other 5% right after that. And we haven't even gotten into mining centralization and the uh, crazy costs of mining <laughs> now. So like, there's a lot of factors going on here. Um, yeah, do, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think it just goes to show um, just how quick valuations can change. Because, uh, you know, I talk about this all the time. People who try to analyze the Bitcoin price, they use all these, like, you know, fancy indicators and statistical analysis and things like that. Um, but, you know, if you want to figure out why the price is dropping, it's really simple. It's because people value their coins less for whatever reason. Um, and, you know, no amount of, no amount of empirical, you know, or, I mean, quantitative analysis can uncover the reasoning behind people changing their valuations. So we can, all we can really say is that people don't really want Bitcoins anymore. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of people who want to spend it instead of holding it. Yeah, and that, you know, that could good and bad because Bitcoin is becoming more of a legitimate currency because people are actually using it instead of just hoarding it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But at the same time, it's hurting the value, um, which can, you know, diminish its viability uh, in terms of, you know, expanding. Um, people aren't really going to, if its purchasing power is low, people aren't really going to want it. Um, but yeah, like it's going to take a lot for the value to stabilize, for the price to stabilize. Um, and the main thing is going to be, you know, getting suppliers and people higher up the production chain to accept it. Um, and you know, you said, you said you didn't think it was likely because, um, a, a lot of merchants aren't really concerned with getting, paying their suppliers in Bitcoin. They just want that like extra profit they make from the lower transaction fees. Uh, you know, but I would argue that that, that that reason is exactly why a lot of the suppliers would start um, accepting Bitcoin too, because they, they could see how much money they can save by letting their, letting the merchants buy things from them in Bitcoin mm -hmm. instead of, you know, bank transfers or, you know, however they do it with, obviously we'll have lots of then it'll just it'll start moving up, and um, th you know they'll they'll start out doing it because not for any ideological reasons or anything. It's just cheaper. Um, but then you know as that progresses, it'll be cheaper to just use Bitcoin as the main currency. You know because everybody will be accepting it. Yeah, because it is at, at its core, it is a pretty efficient technology for transferring value. That's the main thing about the blockchain. It's just super simple to just you know, pay a five cent transaction fee and just switch the, you know, switch. Okay. This person owns this amount of Bitcoins. Boom. Now this person owns that amount. So it's, it's super easy way of transferring value and super efficient. And that's where the, the, the basic appeal comes from, um, you know, plus anonymity or pseudonym, pseudonymity and stuff like that. But yeah, it's the, it's the payment system at, at the end of the day that makes it worth something. But yeah, it's people value their coins less. There's people who are spending a lot of coins um, on, you know, all the all the multitude of stuff that you can buy with Bitcoin now, and there aren't that many people buying Bitcoin. You know, like there's there's been this huge push this year to like spread adoption and get more people to buy, and there's been some. Uh, marginal developments in the buying space um circle has has recently launched for the people who requested an invite including me and i've been using circle for the past week you know just testing out with testing out with small amounts buying uh from excuse me buying from you know buying with my debit card you know uh and 
uh, it's super simple and, and instant. And but like still, even Circle is not available to everyone yet. It's not totally public. And the fact that we are barely getting um, this type of easy buying now in in late 2014. Uh, where where it's just instant buy from your debit or credit card, um, like it's it's kind of late to the party in terms of like how easy it is to spend Bitcoin compared to how easy easy it is to buy it back and for new people to to buy into it. So it's like a merchant adoption has really 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 outpaced the speed of uh, consumer adoption. So that's huge downward pressure on the price. Um, but you know, let's shift gears a little bit to like the mining, the mining aspect of it. Um, mining is more expensive than ever. Uh, it's it's super super difficult to get into the mining space unless you have like thousands and thousands of dollars to you know just drop on a on a mining rig and get involved. And uh, you know, even then, you are not even guaranteed to make a profit, and the profit that you do make is going to be pretty tiny and you're probably going to uh, sell your, your bitcoins anyway to pay for your necessary expenses like electricity and things like that and then you know when you look at the large mining operations um, like the, the gigantic mining farms in China uh, that we've recently seen exposed in uh, outlets like the coinsman.com did a great in-depth um, uh, report into a Chinese mining farm like these people have huge gigantic warehouses of ASICs that are mining Bitcoin that's their sole purpose like not just a machine sole purpose to mine Bitcoin a whole gigantic warehouse mining Bitcoin and you know it costs a lot to set that up and to pay bills every single month I believe the stat statistic was uh, they pay sixty thousand dollars every single month in electricity alone uh just for that one mining farm which is insane and you know that's the, also a huge waste of electricity yes yeah huge huge waste and the electricity company does not take bitcoin you can be damn sure of that <laughs> so like it's they have to sell immediately to to keep in their profit and like who knows? Maybe they sell all the bitcoins they mine. Maybe they don't even want to be invested at all in a, in a bearish market like this. So you've got that huge selling pressure from gigantic mining operations um, who have to do that to to stay in business and keep operating and 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 pay their suppliers and pay the electricity company. So that's that's more that's more selling pressure, and that's a symptom of the proof of work scheme that Bitcoin currently uses to secure the blockchain super super costly and it's only getting worse it's only getting worse like um like i said you know small time miners small time miners as in people who pay over a thousand dollars for a mining rig that's small time now those people are going to be pushed out of the market pretty soon enough anyway if the difficulty keeps rising and, and they won't be able to stay profitable they'll shut down their mining rigs and then basically eventually like I don't want to sound too pessimistic, but we got to look at this as a real possibility. Like eventually there could just be, you know, a handful, maybe a dozen, maybe two dozen or whatever it is, just a handful of gigantic mining farms that, you know, just mine Bitcoin and no one else can possibly afford to get involved with the network and get involved with securing the network. So that's not a very bright feature for uh, Bitcoin mining in my opinion and like in order to fix that like some kind of change to the protocol will, will be needed i don't know if it's going to be a hard fork or what it's going to be but like bitcoin mining it's it's not in a good place right now not only the down the downward pressure on the price but also the fact that like any any government with enough resources and guns can drop in there and point a, point a few guns to the heads of these people who are managing these mining farms and basically take control of those mining farms just like that. So that's the danger of centralized mining operations. Well, I think what we might see on a more um, short-term scale is we might see mining 
as a whole slow down. You know, not just the little guys, but the big farms also, because um, you know, if ever you know, all things being equal, you know, the price is going to keep going down. It you know, it could go way down. Um, and uh, you know, at some point, mining in general is just going to become unprofitable, and you know, they're going to have to stop because, um, especially these these uh, big you know, mining farms, they're not, you know, they're not invested ideologically, so, you know, they're not going to mine at a loss. Um, so, you, they're going to, they're going to slow their mining down, and it may, you know, the price may even go low enough to where, um, you know, they might stop mining altogether, and the supply will, uh, you know, the supply will stop growing. Um, but, you know, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It'll give, it'll put a, you know, brief pause on mining centralization and give, uh, you know, I don't want to say the foundation because I have no faith in them, but, you know, it'll give the community um, a little more time to work on problems with the protocol. Um, maybe Gavin Andreessen will come up with a solution. Who knows? You know, um, uh, the problem is a bunch of people have come up with possible solutions, and I'm sure that Gavin Andreessen has thought, like, a lot about this issue, along with a lot of devs in the community. But the problem is you have to get the miners to agree on these changes before they become official, or at least get most of the rest of the network to agree. And that's the hardest thing, is getting people to agree on changes that might not necessarily be in line with their personal interests and their personal investments in mining rigs. So that's that's the really hard part. And I think Mike Hearn has referred to this problem before as well. Like any proposed changes to the code and developments they just result result in you know f flame wars and, and and arguments between the devs about about what to do and there's a bunch of entrenched interests so it's really really hard to implement changes to the protocol but like don't get me wrong i i, I hope that someone can figure it out and improve this a little bit because no doubt bitcoin is is not perfect it's there's still a lot of flaws and the great thing is you know being a programmable currency um, you know, based on P2P networking, changes can be implemented uh, in an easier way than changing a corrupt government institution. But it's still it's still challenging, and it's still going to take a lot of work and convincing people to you know change what they're doing. Right. Well, you know, even you when you do have to convince the miners, uh, you know, the ones who aren't really giving. Or, well, not really saving, but improving Bitcoin. Yeah, like yeah, that that would make things continue on the way they are for a while. But um, you know, eventually that's still you know they're still gonna you know turn around and bite themselves in the ass because they're uh, the the price will continue going down as centralization can continue, continues to increase. So they're still gonna eventually have to shut down their rigs. Um, you know, so at that point. Bitcoin could get low enough to where you know the major players in the mining industry just kind of leave and sell all their equipment and stuff, uh, you know. And then like we kind of get to start over a little bit because um, the only people that'll be left are the ones who are like really, really invested, dedicated ideologically in Bitcoin. Principles. Yeah, and yeah. and then those will be the ones who start adopting the new versions and and uh, you know things like that. Because and you know just I want to go back to. One thing I kind of, kind of have this little hunch that, you know, the price is or the market is still trying to correct from Mount Gox, um, because you know as everybody knows the price got way pumped by Mount Gox um, and you know the Willy Bot, yeah, uh, which was we figured out about you know several months ago, and so um, yeah, can we know, let's just go through that just a quick summary of the Willy Bot? Um, was it basically like? It would it would buy like twice as much Bitcoin as it was actually paying. It would get twice as much Bitcoin and it would it would pump the price right. Like a thousand dollars wasn't the real price because it was being manipulated by bots. Yeah, I can't. I don't really. It was such a long time ago since I wrote that article that I can't really remember exactly what was happening. But um, but basically there were these two bots, Willie and, and they were like they're called Willie and Marcus, and they operated, um. You know, there's strong evidence to suggest that they operated actually inside the Mt. Gox exchange, and they were basically like fraudulently 
pumping up the price because they would um they would buy bitcoin without actually spending any money they would just like put they were just like it would be put on the ledger that it was a buy order so the price would go up and up and up and up and then um you know but then when mount gox so crashed shady. when it, when it like shut down you know the whole thing kind of fell apart and the price fell way low you know but then there were some other things that you know kept pumping it up a little bit uh you know and put a you know gave a brief break to the fall um so you know i think i think you know we very well could still be correcting the mount gox price uh yeah. or the mount gox bubble uh, you know for lack of a better word it wasn't really a bubble but that's a different discussion so I'm telling how low the floor is going to be um so yeah you know as things are going to start settling out may, maybe not you know soon it might take maybe a year or two but things will start settling out um the price will reach a point uh, where it's more reflective of the market sentiment towards Bitcoin and not the you know exchange pumps, um, and then I think I think we're gonna see a lot of miners like actually get out of the game, and you know that that is will in no way fix the problem, um, but it will kind of slow it down a little bit and give give you know the developers a chance to maybe try to find a solution. Yeah, um, you know I. I, I really I disagree that you know that large mining operations would get out of the game. Like before they get out of the game, the small miners are going to get out of the game way b before the mining farms do, um, because they've just dropped so much money and so much investment into these you know hundreds of ASIC machines that are stacked on these shelves, and for them to get out of the game is much harder than small-time miners getting out of the game. Um, and, and plus the, the fact that like large mining operations are the ones that are most profitable. If they have the most hashing power or a good chunk of hashing power, then they also get a good chunk of block rewards. Uh, they, they get the most profits from the Bitcoin blockchain and mining. So like before we start seeing them get out, we're going to see all the small time miners get out first. And, and that's, I mean, that's been happening for, for, for months now is you can't you can't even get involved anymore unless you spend over a thousand dollars yeah well that's why i said mining as a whole would slow down right because it doesn't matter how big your operation is your profit is still based on the price of bitcoin or the value of bitcoin um and it doesn't matter how valuable bitcoin is the more that are mined into existence the harder it gets to mine them and the less you get per block while at the same time your electricity costs are going up so you know at some point the price of bitcoin is going to be so low that even the biggest mining farms they're going to be paying you know maybe millions of dollars uh in electricity um to get like you know nine hundred thousand dollars worth of bitcoin if that mm. uh you know so it it doesn't matter how big the the mining uh, farm is or how profitable it is right now um, their profits are going to dwindle as difficulty increases um, and it's going to increase as long as mining goes on it has you know it doesn't really have anything to do with the value um, as more people, so, people get involved in mining than hashing increases you're saying that hashing can like kind of level out and maybe even drop a little bit right if if people get out like eventually people are going to stop wanting to get involved in bitcoin mining right because it's not it's just simply yeah. not as profitable as it once was yeah that's what it was designed to do like um that's what makes bitcoin deflationary on a whole like right now obviously it's kind of inflationary but you know on the long run uh bitcoin was designed to be deflationary because um you know the the more bitcoins there are the harder it is to mine them um and that's true regardless of what the price is. So if it goes low enough where it's uh, where it's too expensive to mine them, you know, you're putting more into, you're paying more in electricity than you are getting out of your block rewards, uh, then nobody's going to mine. So, um, yeah. I and think, then hashing power would go down overall. Yeah, yeah. Then hashing power would go down overall because people uh, would just, you know, they'd stop mining because they'd be losing money and not getting money. Yeah. And the whole point of mining is to, you know, profit off of it. So, 
yeah, centralization is a problem. It's got to be fixed. Um, but I think at some point we could see a break in it. Um, who, like, who knows when it could be? Because you know, tomorrow something could happen to make the price skyrocket, and then mining will you it's know profitable all of a sudden go yeah. up even faster. But I think, like, on a long term, like on like really way out in the horizon, um, the price is probably going to go way low just because of a, you know a bunch of different factors that are producing uh, selling pressure, and. Uh, you know, combined with the fact that last year the price got pumped like way higher than it probably should have been, or if it, or the, way higher than it would have been if Mount Gox, you know, never pulled their whole, you know, yeah, <laughs> their whole gig. It's, so it's still crazy to think about that. That just happened earlier this year. It seems like a long time ago at this point. Yeah, because like, we pay attention to all the all the developments that happen week by week you know, in this space. And then it's like, wow, Mount Gox failed less than a year ago. And all yeah. that bullshit that happened was less than a year ago. Wow. Yeah. The time ten, is weird. It was, it was what, like 10 months ago, you know, not even a year ago, the price was at 1200. Um, and now it's at 392, uh, you which know, is still <laughs> higher than it was exactly a year ago. That's yeah. crazy too. Yeah. It was, what was it? Like before it like jumped way up to thousand, it was at what, like 200, yeah, Something like you know that. the 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 Silk Road takedown happened in early October, and then there was there was a small flash crash after that, and then after that flash crash was when you started seeing the build up to December, and then a, a huge spike in late November as well. So, but like last year in mid September, I mean I'd have to go and and check uh, Bitcoinity uh, dot org, but you know late late september yeah that was <laughs> the price was just barely uh starting to uh rise at that point cuz last year it was stable actually it was stable for a long time there was a bubble in early uh april where the price skyrocketed to over $200 and then crashed uh back down to below 100 and then after that the price was stable for pretty much the whole summer around the uh around the like hundred hundred dollar range hundred fifty dollar range and then yeah the silk road bust happened and then like the, you know the the prevailing theory around that was you know with silk road taken down a lot of investors felt like it was legitimate now the black market was taken out of it that factor was taken out so investors saw that it was a legitimate investment to go into and then the u.s government started being open to it as well so that provided more legitimacy and then we saw that huge gigantic bubble in in late November and then into December as well. Yeah, so, you know, clearly, Mount Gox wasn't that long ago, so, you know, it's it's not too far of a stretch to say that we're still feeling some of the pain from Mount Gox. You know, so there's going to be, I see a lot of volatility happening in the future, and who knows where the price might end up. Um, and depending on how low it gets, that could affect mining as well. Um, but you know, like I said, that's in no way going to actually fix mining. It, it would just, you know, at the very best, slow it down a little bit. So, I mean, I don't know. The intricacies yep. of mining and hashing algorithms is way over my head. So I don't yeah. really know what mine as I don't well. Really honestly, know. I'm just doing yeah, my like, best to try and see, you know, try and hash out, hash out <laughs> 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 what what other people analyze about it and try and understand what's going on at a basic level. But like, I don't understand cryptography on a basic level i just know yeah. that it's super secure it's the best way of securing information that has ever been invented and applying that to a global ledger of currency is a fairly genius idea and it has been a genius idea for the past few years um but like i i keep going back to mining centralization i think that that is like everyone talks about oh you know the fundamentals haven't changed about bitcoin it's still it's still the same basic technology Actually, not necessarily. It's not necessarily the same basic te technology. The fundamentals have changed in a in a way because it used to be you could uh, join the network and participate in securing the network with just your regular old desktop computer at home. Um, yep. Now it's become a huge industry. Now it's way. now it's a huge industry where you, it takes thousands upon thousands of dollars to get involved and, yeah. and start. You mining. have to get funding. You got to be part of the elite to participate in Bitcoin mining. And that's not how it used to be. That's a fundamental change that's happened. And, you know, 
it's it's i i think that there's a legitimate discussion to be had about changing the algorithm of bitcoin to something that's more efficient and is more inclusive to everyone who wants to use it um or maybe even possibly possibly use moving to a to a different coin as the main like currency in the crypto community uh you know and there's a lot of people working on altcoins trying to achieve that and i think there's a very legitimate discussion to be made about whether one of them can um can rise to that occasion and accomplish that uh it would be a huge uphill battle because you'd have to basically convince um all the same you know merchants and app developers who have been building on top of bitcoin this whole time convince them to maybe use a different currency and that's not going to happen anytime soon because there's a lot of people still who still see as bitcoin as the one the one yeah true like, crypto. I, I was just about to say that you know i'd much I'd much rather see Bitcoin actually get fixed than to have to move to a new currency. Because, uh, you know, there's just been such an amazing, like, economy rise up um, around Bitcoin over the past year. It is amazing. And, and I you know, I'd really hate to see all that go away because, you, you know, there's people who, you know, for the most part live off Bitcoin now. Like, there's, like, you can do that if you want to do it bad enough. You know, you can figure out a way to do it. And that's, I think that's crazy. Like, I think that's awesome. So, yeah. I mean, like I said, I know literally nothing about um, about mining beyond the fact that it was, you know, designed to be deflationary and, you know, like the basic economic concepts surrounding that. You know, like as far as the hashing algorithm is concerned, like, I have no idea how you would go about fixing that. You know, but clearly something has to be done because um, it's not really that – Bitcoin is not really that decentralized anymore. Um and so yeah there's got to be some kind of like maybe switch to a different algorithm or like make some kind of like modified proof of work energy efficient and uh, it doesn't require such you know large rigs or something i don't know but something like there's got to be something that makes it impossible for mining to be centralized because that's the only way to maintain a truly decentralized currency which is what bitcoin is supposed to be that's why I originally got involved two years ago is because, you know, of the promise of the t actual technology. Like, I mean, I, um, you know, I was, I was 18 years old in 2008 um, when the economy crashed. Um, and, you know, there's, there's competing theories about why the economy crashed. But the pre prevailing one is that, you know, subprime mortgages were handed out like candy to people who didn't deserve them and weren't able to pay them off and then those mortgages were packaged and resold among the banks between themselves you know hiding their their you know volatility and you know the fact that you couldn't trust the people who were going to pay back those loans and just hugely complex uh you know <laughs> financial trading between banks and their risk taking helped to crash the economy and it's like you know Maybe we can build a better system than this, something that's based on uh, a decentralized network where you don't have to trust um, a few people in suits in a tall building to manage your money correctly. Um, you can just trust a decentralized network that, may, you know, the protocol, the code was written to basically maintain itself. People join the network, but they have to follow, you know, a set list of rules for maintaining the blockchain and that's freaking genius that's amazing it's a huge development um i'm not sure exactly where i was going with that point <laughs> but uh you know, it, it was it was amazing it was amazing back then but now that that promise has kind of been um diminished a little bit with the recent developments in the bitcoin mining space and i mean like i kind of i speak as an outsider a little bit in terms of bitcoin mining because i've never actually mined bitcoin myself there was a probably there was a point when i first got involved where i probably could have mined um although even back even back then i didn't have a powerful computer uh just you know a dinky kind of you know middle middle of the line laptop so i couldn't really do anything back then even really but uh that was the promise back then that it was a decentralized network where anyone with you know a computer can participate and secure the network that's not the case anymore. It's a fundamental change that's happened. It's not maintained by a network of computers. 
and that's a fun that's you know that a lot of Bitcoin educational videos still mention that as a as how Bitcoin works or people with computers con connect in a dis decentralized way um, no <laughs> Um, if you try and mine Bitcoin with your computer, uh, you will waste a lot of electricity and possibly even ruin your computer with all the energy ex it expends. Uh, it's, it's not a decentralized network of computers. It's a, it's a decentralized network of, uh, of ASICs. And people need to get educated. If you're going to invest in Bitcoin or get involved in, with Bitcoin at all, you've got to understand that ASICs control everything now large collections of ASICs control everything now. And that's what you're buying into. That's the network you're buying into. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, th the landscape is fundamentally different now than it was one year ago or two years ago. And uh, it's, we've got to, you know, it's, it's rapidly changing. You know, every month or so, so much happens in, in one month, not in just in mining, but, you know, in security and in merchant adoption. Like, you have to reevaluate the space every month if you want to be an informed investor and uh it's funny it just just as we're recording this podcast I, no I noticed the price dropped again from 396 to 390 um by the time this podcast gets uploaded who knows it'll be at 350 <laughs> by then so it's 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 constantly in flux and you know it's kind of it's kind of fun to follow it and try and be as informed as possible following this but then it's also it's 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 difficult as well trying to be as informed as possible about all the changes that happen on a week by week basis in this industry. So yeah, yeah, it's definitely gonna take someone a lot smarter than me to fix. It. Even yeah. then, that's kind of like the beauty of Bitcoin is that it can be fixed. You know, like how how do you like how how would you fix you know a paper currency ran by the central bank that's running everything into the ground without completely overhauling the entire system. You know, yeah. where, whereas yeah. with Bitcoin, all it takes is, you know, changing a couple, maybe changing a couple lines of code and uh, getting enough people to download the update and, and it's fixed. Like, that's, you, you know, even... People even who Bitcoin, are smart, relatively smart as well. You know, theoretically, it shouldn't take that much convincing you know, make good arguments and you can get them to update the code, maybe even if it uh, goes against their personal financial interests, you know? Right. So even if, even if Bitcoin does end up becoming a complete failure because of mining centralization, which I think is something Satoshi never even saw coming. Uh, but, you know, even if it does, even if it doesn't end up working out, it created a way to have a monetary system that can be uh, acutely modified and to like small degrees to change little details, but it can make a huge impact. It's and it's something something that could never happen with any other monetary technology we've had. Uh, like not you know not even gold. Even though like gold, depending on who you talk to, my personal opinion is that gold is infinitely better than a, a, a system of central banking and paper money. Um, but in terms of adaptability, um, you know, gold doesn't hold a candle to cryptocurrency. Yeah. You can't so, send go gold over the internet. Yeah. Instantly. So in any amount you want, even if Bitcoin doesn't end up being, you know, like the one digital currency, at least it, you know, started it, like it kicked, uh, that has made, um, that can make money in general much, much less centralized, and you know, you don't have to trust as many people, and it can be, you know, minor problems can be fixed without overhauling the entire economy. Yeah, you know, and that in itself is pretty significant. So, uh, but yeah. you know, I still like to get rich off Bitcoin. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think we all would. <laughs> that's oh, that's a wonderful pipe dream. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you're more likely to get rich off of like you know putting a shit ton of money into some uh, random new altcoin that picks up that you've like researched and uh, you know try to figure out that it's it's secure and has a ton of great uses in the future has a great dev team behind it or maybe like even just something that has great marketing and it's just a pump and dump like if you can just time your your buy and sell right 
you can pump and mm-hmm. dump uh, an altcoin and get rich off that. You're yeah, more likely like, to get rich off that than off Bitcoin. Like, uh, take Redcoin, for example. There are people um, who have, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions, some people even have billions of Redcoin. They're Redcoin uh, billionaires. All it would take is for Redcoin to hit $1, and there would be an entire community of people who are rich. Yeah. <laughs> like... Yeah, that's like, why red that's coin how, is not a dollar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's how crazy cryptocurrency is. Uh it's just so the whole idea of it or the whole ecosystem of all cryptocurrency is just so volatile. Like there's just no way of knowing what's going to be around the it's tough. Corner. It's tough and so much of it is j- driven just by marketing as well. I mean, you brought up Redcoin. Um Redcoin has an innovative um algorithm that no one else has really tried which is proof of stake velocity um takes the proof of stake algorithm to to a new interesting level where they try and incentivize people to uh transact in red coin like you get you get more interest back if you if you tip people in red coin i believe that's the (laughs) gist of how it works so that's an interesting thing that thing they came up with, and they try and use that as part of their marketing scheme, where it's the social currency, and you'll want to send it to people like all the time for you know their their contributions um, on you know on media websites and, and social networking websites. But like even even that is just mostly um, marketing, right? Like they they have people who go on forums and stuff and try and push Redcoin, and they get Redcoin for it. So like. And, and that's true for for a lot of cryptocurrencies. Dark coin is just marketed as the anonymous cryptocurrency, even though there's additions to Bitcoin that make it pretty damn anonymous. Um, so, like all these altcoins have, you know, just marketing gimmicks. Like I, I don't want to say gimmicks as in like a, a totally derogatory way because it it can potentially uh, evolve into something substantial in the future. But like, it's 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 hard to find a coin that is um, actually innovative and is not just telling you it's innovative. Um, like I think Ethereum is one of those rare examples where uh, it has a huge amount of potential to actually be innovative. But even that is just a lot of marketing as well. They have huge, gigantic, successful uh, marketing people on their team who made a really nice, super super nice website for them, and they're really good at communicating the potential of Ethereum to uh, people who might want to get involved with the project or invest in it. But it's it's just it's all it's all marketing, you know. It's, it's so much of it is still vaporware at this point, and um, and even even going back to Bitcoin, even going back to Bitcoin, so many you know possible. Uh, applications of the technology are just barely beginning to get built at this point in late 2014. Uh, 2014 has been designated the the year of multi-sig, multi-signature transactions that increase security and also enable like multiple people to manage the same pool of funds. Like that's that's barely being implemented this year by a few different companies. And there's some that are pushing for for greater adoption of multi-sig because it's more secure and stuff. Um, you know, I'm I'm going to use that as the transition to uh, you know kind of a a more positive topic than what we've talked about so far in the podcast. <laughs> um, you know, like a lot of companies now are starting to release their uh, API for developers uh, making applications on top of Bitcoin. And like just in the past week or past two weeks, we've seen a bunch of um, companies releasing APIs. Coinbase has released their API called Toshi. Uh, this company called Chain has released their own API and they have venture funding from people like Barry Silbert and Pantera Capital. Um, this company called BlockCypher has released an API that uses multi-signature to increase security. And this company called Gem has released an API that also does security. They raised $2 million from a bunch of different investors, including First Round Capital. And BitPay has released their own API for developers. So we see a bunch of like companies that have already 
gotten their success, basically, in the case of BitPay and Coinbase. They've had huge success in the past year, and they're trying to give back to the community by creating these APIs, which um, basically make it easier for developers to interact with the blockchain. If you want to make an app, you don't have to necessarily learn um, all of the intricacies of, of the blockchain and, and, and how to, um, how to util utilize Bitcoin transactions on a basic level. You have an API that kind of does that for you, so you can focus on making the apps on top of it. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not totally versed in this, but it sounds like a pretty good analogy would be like when um, you know when the iPhone first came out and they didn't have user made apps or even develop you know independently made apps for the iPhone then after a year or so after people started doing it anyway and releasing it on like jailbroken iPhones Apple released an API for developers to uh, you know to make apps on, on the iPhone where you don't necessarily have to understand the basic underworkings and technical stuff of, of the iPhone. You just have to have programming skills to make your actual app. You don't have to necessarily hire someone who, you know, is a Bitcoin expert. You can just focus on making your apps. And, like, there's a, there's a whole host of APIs now for you to choose from, which everyone is the best option for whatever kind of app you're trying to make. Whether you need security, whether you need something that automates payments between addresses um, or whatever it is you can just choose the best one and go with that and just make your app on top of it and I believe I think like a good number of these apps are just free to use some might cost money for developers to use but that's a pretty that's a pretty good development um, make it easier for developers to make apps because that's that's like one of the main things that I see in potential in Bitcoin is all the multitude of possible apps that can be made on top of the first programmable currency um, so you know hopefully we see a lot of developers um, utilizing this and building stuff on top of it I mean we could see a lot of problems with Bitcoin being solved you know just from that right because you know because then we can you know bring in a lot of developers to make applications maybe not you know needed changes to the actual you know core protocol but things Maybe you know some some more short term fixes or something, uh, just because it's easier to develop now. Um, right. I don't know. Maybe I'm not understanding that correctly. Maybe that's not the right yeah, kind of it's, applications that can be developed. Yeah, but. it's not going to fix mining centralization. That's for sure because they can't change the core protocol. But it will create, um, you know, brand new financial instruments for people to manip manipulate their Bitcoin with. Um, like I, I'm still. I've been waiting to like make I've been thinking about like making my own website for this but like someone needs to create a service where uh you just have like a list of popular bitcoin addresses where you can send money to like a list of charities and then like a list of merchants and you know a bunch of people where you can send money to or and then like a game section or something like with that includes seals with clubs and then just from one app or one website, you can have this list of like popular addresses to send to and, you know, send bitcoins to whoever you need to. It's like it's like an address book that's preloaded with all the places that you might necessarily want to send your money to. Simple idea, but like no one's I don't know, maybe I haven't found it yet, but no one seems to have made something like that. And like okay. that will be a lot easier to make in a in an efficient way and innovative way. Um, by using, you know, one of these APIs, probably. Yeah, that would be really cool it, um, if it was customized, too. Like, you'd have a default set of addresses, uh, like, you know, suggested places you could, you know, donate to or buy the services. Uh, but then also, you could, like, you know, add your own, customize your address list, maybe, you know, share with other people. Yeah. You know, that could be, like, a cool little social network to, you know, grow. Yeah. Uh, businesses maybe even crazy. like uh you know have a favorite option so you can favorite certain addresses and keep them in your you know favorites tab and you know yeah add in the social network aspect and maybe people could review certain addresses and say oh yeah this is a really great charity you know they uh you know i'm sure that sean's outpost would get a lot of great reviews you know they they use the bitcoins directly to help the homeless people in florida and they're building like a, a great new facility for housing the homeless and you know educating them and and 
building skills for the homeless so they can improve their lives. And like, you know, that would be in, an, in a review or for it, or at least a description, you know, uh, and it would get like, you know, 4.8 stars out of five, you know, it, it could be like the Yelp for Bitcoin addresses. I was just about to say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, that would be cool if that existed. And, um, it's just an, that's kind of an, an idea I've been toying with for the, for the past couple of weeks. I, I was thinking about making a website to accomplish that, but um, that costs money. I'm not sure if, if I want to do that right now. But um, someone should someone should definitely make that. And um, I mean that's just that's just a random idea that just consolidates you know different um, aspects of the industry that already exist and kind of combining them into like a convenient, easy to use place. There's tons of other possibilities that can be made on top of these APIs. It's kind of it's really kind of ridiculous. The the sky is the limit, and uh, people just got to use their imaginations to build brand new financial instruments that could you know never existed before and you know definitely you know legacy financial institutions are not going to implement anything like that anytime soon um so that's that's what cryptocurrencies enable and finally we're, we're starting to see the beginnings of you know that crazy app potential yeah hopefully you know we'll get a lot of cool stuff out of it and strengthen the the uh, economy at the same time the bitcoin economy yeah bitcoin really needs a killer app uh we need a killer app where people will be like wow that is amazing um like oh, I, I could never do that before with any of my legacy financial institutions with my with my freaking visa yeah, card like and my banks and stuff something that would just make it extremely easy to use right because right? that's all we need to get people to you know more people to get on board it just well, has to be easier to use I would say it is kind of easy to use at this point. I mean, look at all the wallets that are available right now. All the wallets you can choose from. Um, you know, I used to be a big fan of Hive, Hive Wallet, but one of the things that I got kind of tired of with them was uh, they only give you one address that you can use for your wallet, um, and you can't generate new addresses for new purposes or anything like that. Their only innovation basically is, um, you know, you can customize your address book of other people to send to. You can add pictures for them and change their names and stuff. And then they have like an app store where you can deposit your bitcoins into like a like a little mini game or something, or you know a merchant or Coinbase or whatever that's built into the app. But they're even going to take that out soon. They announced they're going to take that out with the next version of Hive. So I've been I've been using the blockchain app recently, and the blockchain app for Android, while it's a little bit glitchy and crashes sometimes um it is the best option for like organizing addresses generating new addresses um and it's 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 pretty smooth and they have the merchant map now as well which i haven't used much but it's pretty nice so i mean i would say that it, it's pretty easy to use bitcoin now if you just download the right app and if they just stop it from crashing you know every once in a while um, it's really easy to use and pretty secure as long as you have a good password. Um, you don't necessarily need to make a paper wallet or anything like that. That's just if you if you hold like if you hold dozens of bitcoins or or even hundreds of bitcoins, then in that case you should have a paper wallet because someone wants your bitcoins and is willing to hack you for it. But for just like regular regular consumer amounts, using something like the blockchain wallet is perfectly fine. It's perfectly great actually. And makes it really easy to use. We just need it. We just need a killer app where someone can be like, "Wow, that like I can, you know, I did an interview with the Leetcoin CEO, and he talked about how their company is trying to integrate Bitcoin rewards into video games, or people compete for Bitcoin in games like Team Fortress 2 and uh, League of Legends, and like that could that could be a killer app if it's implemented right. People will be like, "Wow, I can." I can comp compete for real money in real time, you know, within a game, right? Um, I don't know if that would spread consumer adoption a lot. If, if a lot of people would be like, well, let me be buy cool, Bitcoin so I can, so I can like risk it in this video game. But yeah, it would be definitely cool. And like, we need, we need more apps like that stuff that you can't, you just simply can't do it with, uh, with regular freaking debit cards or cash or anything like that. Yeah, like even even make like 
maybe not even revolutionary things, just things that make would make Bitcoin more fun, you know. Think the video game integration, uh, you know, that, that wouldn't solve any monumental problems. <laughs> and it, you know, it wouldn't send the value through the roof, but the, playing video fun. game, competing in video games for Bitcoins, like even if it was like, you know, 50 cents worth, yeah, that'd be fun. Um, yeah, yeah, we could, that, like, I guess we could see a lot of cool little things like that come out of these APIs just because it would make it a lot easier to, you know, develop things like that. Yeah, yeah, hell yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of Seals with Clubs. Uh, you what know, is that? I, I've heard you talk about it before, but, you know, you've never, like, really explained it. So it's basically poker. It's poker okay. online. And you can bet Bitcoin in it. And, you know, there's different tiers of levels depending on how much you want to bet in a, in a game. You know, you can – you can one one chip on Seals with Clubs is the equivalent of um, one millibitcoin, which is – what 40 cents right now so each chip is 40 cents and then like from there you can you can if you want to you can just enter a game with um like what i usually do is i enter games where the buy-in is like 10 to 20 uh chips so i go in with basically four to eight dollars and um like do you, do you know how to play poker do you know like the rules and stuff no, um, i've never played it before yeah, I mean, basically, like, you just go around in a circle, and everyone basically bets based on how much they think their hand is worth. If they think they have a pretty badass hand, like, you know, two aces, double aces, they're like, oh, I'll probably win this. So then they'll, they'll bid up the price a little bit, and they'll bid it up. You don't have to bid, like, a whole chip at once, maybe just, like, a, a hundredth of a chip, you know, um, in, in one round. And then as the round goes on and you see more cards in the middle of the table then people will start you know can can bid even higher to try and either get other people out and to to fold their hands so you have a better chance of winning or if you honestly believe that you can win then you're just basically baiting them into risking more of their money into something that you're pretty confident you're going to win so it's a it's a lot of psychology involved and honestly like i've I've went and played poker for money at friends friends houses before and uh and I usually lose because <laughs> you need a good poker face. Uh and I don't I don't have a good poker you, face. You get too excited. I get too excited when I'm about <laughs> to win. <laughs> and like if I if I try and force myself to have a plain like neutral face, then y you know <laughs> that kind of interferes with my thinking and, and, and judgment about how my actual hand is going to be played. So it's, it's kind of difficult to have a poker face, but you know, online <laughs> playing online, you don't, your face is not shown, you yeah. know, so you can, you can bluff pretty easily um, and make people think that you have a better hand than you do. And, uh, and if you can do that successfully, then you can win at poker. And that's, what's, that's pretty, what's pretty awesome about seals with clubs. You can basically gamble and, um, and with poker, at least, you don't have to take the risk of other opponents looking at you and studying your body language to see if you're lying or not. So that's, I think that's a pretty cool application of Bitcoin, and I love Seals with Clubs. We just need to see more stuff like that, you know? And Leap yeah, Coin is trying to more, do that. You know, make it more fun, maybe a little easier to use. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, some people are going to look down on that and be like, "Oh, Bitcoin enables gambling and you know all all this shady stuff." Well, people like to do that. It's fun yeah, for people it, to risk you money with your money. Bit. You know, yeah. it's your own fault if you lose it. Yeah, if you want, if you want to risk it, then you can risk it. Like, there's a there's a million ways in society that are you know state sanctioned and society sanctioned where you can risk your money legally. Uh, you can invest in stocks all day long and lose your money there if you want to that's an, that's in a way gambling yeah i think it's funny how uh you know most state governments are really strict about gambling um but then they turn around and have the education lotteries which is you know oh hundreds yeah of, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of gambling oh <laughs> yeah those freaking sc scratcher oh, cards that are God. underneath the the glass it's, at every goddamn liquor store it's such a ridiculous double standard. I mean, get over it, guys. Like, people like to gamble their money. It's going to happen. Like, they're not hurting you by throwing their money away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then, of course, you know, gambling in almost every form is legal in Las Vegas and Nevada. 
and you know the people who own those large casinos um, just occasionally try and launch a, a tax against online gambling by you know trying to get favorable yep. laws passed that outlaw online gambling and and things like that. It's like whatever happened to just believing in freedom? <laughs> people can do whatever they yep. whatever they want with. But their you money. know that that reminds me. Um... That reminds me, I saw a video a while back. It was kind of like some kind of like news video, or whatever, on YouTube. And um, they're actually in Vegas and uh, they're interviewing the owner of this casino that accepts Bitcoin. Uh, like, I don't remember exactly uh, what you can do with it. Like, you can maybe you can like buy chips with Bitcoin or something. Uh, but basically, you can go to this casino and, you know, gamble with your Bitcoin. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. That is nice. I mean, we got to see more like that. That's all I'm saying. I want to see more and more more ways to gamble my bitcoins away. They're losing value <laughs> anyway. Why not take risks with them and have fun while the, while the price falls? They're going to be at zero next year anyway. It's not as well have fun with them. Yeah, yeah. It'll probably be a dollar next year if mining centralization keeps going the way it does. No, I don't know. Hey, hey if, it's a dollar, if it's a dollar next year, I'm going to be... I'm gonna be writing like 50 articles a week. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Then when it then when it goes back up again, you know, I'll if, retire. If it goes I, back up again, I'll, I'll cash out and retire. You know, when I'm 21. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's my, yeah. You know, I'm just gonna win. I'm just gonna win a hundred bitcoins on seals with clubs, and then I'll be able to do the same. <laughs> oh, when you have to work for it, Psh, easy. <laughs> Um, what else? What else is there to talk about this week? Digital currency council is oh. what I read about. Oh, what is what is that? Um, it's like an educational center. It's not nonprofit because you like have to pay for like a subscription or tuition or something. Hmm. Um, it's um, and David Berger Berger is the C. David Berger. And he, uh, yeah, David Berger, and he, he, it's basically for Bitcoin businesses, like, um, training in Bitcoin entrepreneurship, uh, and it's just, like, business courses, and it teaches you how to, like, run a Bitcoin business, or the basics of Bitcoin for people who are interested in running a Bitcoin business, huh. and when you complete the courses, you get, like, uh, you know, cert certification, some kind of, you know, certificate oh, or something is that in canada because i heard about something like that from canada as well where they're basically uh, pa passing uh, out certifications to people who demonstrate sufficient knowledge in digital currency which is kind of i mean is it really necessary no it's in, um it's in new york it's based in new york oh wow okay nice there's multiple but of those then starting out it's starting out they're only they're only going to make it available to um accountants, attorneys, and financial professionals, but soon they're going to, like, open it up to everyone. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of like an extension of, uh, was it last week we talked about the university classes? Um, yeah, no, it's kind of like an extension ago. of that, you know? Like, it's, like, maybe a little bit more in-depth education on uh, digital currency. But the question is, how can, you know... I guess you'd have to do research on that in particular institution before you sign up for their classes or whatever. But like, how do you know that they are actually educating you about all the aspects of digital currency? Like when we talked about how, you know, Duke and New York university have those courses now, like we were talking about, Oh, you know, they just focus on the business aspects, right? Like if you just, if they just focus on that, you aren't learning anything about mining you aren't learning anything about, you know, cryptography or the underlying mechanisms. You're just, you're, I mean, you're basically learning how to be an entrepreneur with this new financial in instrument. And I, I would hope that the certification, you know, specifies that specifically. Like, this is someone who's an expert in digital currency entrepreneurship, not necessarily di digital currency protocols you know you like this person that doesn't necessarily have any programming skills but they do know how to run a business you know uh that's based on top of programmers or at least based on top of apis but well yeah i think it's um 
you know, I think that's on par with, uh, you know, business and the economy in general. Like, you know, there's going to be a dichotomy between um, finance and entrepreneurship and, you know, economics and theory. Like, you can yeah. you can be an accountant or some bankster, uh, you know, and know nothing about monetary theory, even though your entire career career is based on dealing in money. So I think, you know, I think both, I think, you know, both forms of education have their merits. This one obviously is more focused towards uh, business and the university classes we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago. It's more like, you know, basic, basic theory and, um, you know, explain basic theory and mechanics of Bitcoin. Um, so... Yeah, there's a, there's a place for both of them, and they don't necessarily have to be part of the same school, because uh, you can have you can have one without the other, and you know you can add value to the community without being an expert in both of them. Because you can true. make yeah, you can make this big business uh, that provides a lot of value, maybe a you know or useful service to the Bitcoin community, yeah, like a killer um, app maybe. Yeah, killer app. You develop it on one of the new APIs, uh, you know. But then you could also be more academic and advance the actual economic theory uh, behind Bitcoin, which, with my personal bias, you know, I, as any regular viewers know, I have like, I'm a big economics nerd, and I teach myself economics in my free time. You know, it shows how much of a social life I have. Um, so I would like to see more of the academic. Uh, classes sprouting up around Bitcoin because I think um, Bitcoin is just so crazy like it challenges like all of the monetary theory that's been established thus far because it's all like well it has to be a commodity it has to be, like come from nature it has to be a good that was used other than uh, currency at first but like we like you said earlier in the podcast there's people who are selling currencies purely because of their marketing uh, that have you know, clearly no prior use value. So there's, you know, obviously there's a lot of interest in it for me because there's just like this really kind of behind the scenes discussion going on between people like Peter Serta, Conrad S. Graf, and some people from the, the Mises Institute. I follow Conrad so on I'd Twitter like, now. He's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to see, definitely see more of that. Um, but yeah, I kind of got off topic there, but my basic point is that, um, you know, there's there's merits in both, and they don't have to be one and the same thing, because uh, they both can be valuable uh, without relying on the other. So yeah, you know that's a, that's a real testament to like how complex this space has gotten, right? Like the fact that you can contribute something meaning, meaningful to the cryptocurrency space, and basically be specializing in one particular area of cryptocurrency and you don't even necessarily have to know how mining works you don't have to know how cryptography works you basically have a programmable currency now that people want to use that is useful for some things and if you could cre create a brand new service that adds adds to the list of useful useful things that you can do about it do with it then yeah <laughs> you can be successful you can make money off of that you can do something really, really valuable with that skill. So it's a real testament to like how how much this is, this is really expanded into the into the overall economy and and you know cryptocurrency applications and usefulness has, has really spread out its tendrils into into all kinds of aspects of of industry, of the economy, of education, and like. It's it's still expanding. We're still seeing this grow, even if even if stuff with like mining centralization is getting kind of funky for my tastes. It is nice <laughs> to see that you know that so much education is expanding and and things like that. So yeah, it, yeah, pretty nice, pretty nice. Yeah, you know, but then again, like you said, um, it if they're not giving you know quality information, that would be an issue. But if something like this, you know, this kind of um, educational service, if it ends up being profitable, you know, which means that you know, people want it and they find it valuable, uh, then the quality would definitely improve because there would be, you know, a whole new industry opening up and 
the way of uh, Bitcoin education. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Man, it's crazy. It's crazy to think how much this is expanding. Bitcoin price is back up to three ninety four. Oh yay. Um so I mean I guess yeah. we could talk about Roger Ver. It's not really surprising considering that he's like put two bounties out on hackers. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if that actually succeeds in um in catching these people. Last week we talked about how Satoshi Nakamoto's email was hacked and a hacker was basically putting up putting it up for ransom, trying to collect bitcoins and then once he collects a certain amount he'll reveal the documents of Satoshi Nakamoto. Well, Roger Veer, it's pronounced Veer, thank you, uh, YouTube commenter, for correcting me on that. Uh, Roger it's Veer. Veer, not, not Veer. Yeah, yeah. That, um, huh. Apparently it's it's Veer, so it's kind of a kind of a weird way to pronounce it, but hey, you know, want to be correct. Yeah. Um, you know, Veer basically has set up a anonymous Bitcoin bounty service uh, where, you know, people can put bounties on the potential arrest and capture of, you know, criminals in the, in the cryptocurrency space, or, I mean, not even limited to that, anything. If you want to catch someone, you can place a reward on it. And if they do get caught and do get arrested, and I think they even have to be convicted as, as well for this to be like a successful catch, then, you know, um, the people who led to that capture and arrest will get a Bitcoin reward. And right now there's a 37 Bitcoin reward um, for the guy who tried to hack Roger Veer himself. And um, and apparently it's the same hacker who, who hacked Roger Veer and Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, there's been evidence showing that it's the same hacker. So like on that one guy or possibly even a group of hackers on their head, is 37 bitcoins and if someone can provide some kind of information leading to uh you know their eventual arrest and conviction for their crimes in traditional uh courts in in actual you know legal jurisdiction in the united states i assume um then the people who led to that can get 37 bitcoins uh which is damn good Fourteen thousand five hundred and eighty seven dollars. All right, yeah, that's pretty nice. I mean Yeah. Yeah, that's uh that's pretty cool, but I think vigilante justice would be way cooler. It's just my personal opinion. Yeah, I mean with I mean, with, with that yeah. that would be interesting, but with that you open a whole big a can of worms. Like people can start putting bounties on, on the heads of people they don't like or someone who like fucked them over in um in the market or you know yeah well i mean obviously like it, it would have to be modern process uh but i mean on like to be a little bit more serious about it is there really that much uh crime for lack of a better word like hacking is is that really such a big issue that you have to put bounties out for people i like, think the so. only yeah like, Really, like big time hackers, it do it happens all the time. I mean, you you just hear about the most high profile ones in the media, um, like when the celebrities were hacked and had their nude pictures leaked. Um, I'm sure that someone would be willing to put a bounty on that hacker's head as well. And that's just the most high profile ones. Like, um, you know, then there's other random cases where people hack into you know, exchanges. Uh, we talked uh, a few weeks ago about how Mint Pal was hacked and people stole a bunch of Veracoin. So, you know, that person, people want to catch that guy. Uh, you know, Darknet markets get hacked sometimes. Um, they, they have to deal with, like, DDoS attacks on a regular basis, and then sometimes people actually try and steal the actual money on the markets themselves. So, like, there's... Hacking is a pretty big, uh, pretty big, like, I, I don't, I don't know if I would call it like an industry or a market or, or what it is, but like, there's a lot of people who do hacking. 
it's popular yeah yeah and there's people who don't like that you know and there's people who want to prevent that and try and catch those people and this is an interesting develop development to yeah, see if people be, can do that you know, with more incentive might not be a vi might end up being a viable service yeah yeah I, and I think that, um, you know, there's been, like, bounty services on the Darknet for a while. Like, I think I haven't been to them myself. I haven't looked at them myself, but I've heard, I've read, you know, news articles that talk about, in addition to the drug markets on the Darknet, you know, there's assassination markets as well. Mm -hmm. And I would have no doubt that there's bounty markets on the Darknet as well. Roger Veer has just merely created... Um, one that's on the clear net um, that, you know, is unregulated as far as I can tell right now. But it's on the clear net. It's open. And, you know, they, they discourage vigilantism because that's a pretty big can of worms, legal can of worms that they don't necessarily want to open. But um, now this one's totally on the clear net and, you know, trying to provide more incentive for people to fight back against hackers because once once yeah. once a hacker is successful and steals whatever information they were trying to get like that like that suddenly have a huge amount of power over the person they stole from um and yeah it's 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 immoral from from like a traditional point of view and people want to try and prevent that it's it's not it's not cool basically and providing yeah. monetary incentive to catch them um, can often provide uh, a necessary service where traditional law enforcement previously failed to, to catch them. Yeah, 37 bitcoins is a pretty big incentive. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm, all right, yeah. Hacking bounties, interesting. I want to see an app. Someone should build an app for that. An app on the API. On the API. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, this has been the Coin Brief Podcast number 16. And we do appreciate all our viewers, everyone who likes the video and comments, um, uh, provides their input. Um, me and Evan are definitely not the smartest guys in the world. <laughs> We're not even close to the smartest guys in the world. Maybe... Oh, well, I mean, I'd have to disagree with that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll just speak for myself. Evan here can <laughs> can run the Bitcoin Foundation if he was given the chance, but uh, I'm I'm not that smart, and I you know I'm certain that there's a there's a ton of people in the community who can make better points than I can, and kind of help to educate all of us at the same time about you know things that we didn't consider relating to these points, and um and certain relating certainly relating to the to the price drop and the current state of you know merchant adoption and mining centralization and stuff like that there's a lot of competing views and about how much influence that has so yeah don't hesitate to comment and uh and provide pretty good counterpoints to us so um yeah definitely thanks for watching uh you know don't forget to like the video subscribe to our youtube channel uh you know follow us on twitter all that good stuff um, if you're so inclined, tip us a little bit of Bitcoin here and there. You know, we do appreciate it very much. Uh, you know, and we'll we'll be back next week with some more news in the cryptocurrency space. So yeah, this has been your open source for digital currency news, and um, thanks everyone for watching, and uh, catch us next week.